So welcome everyone to our first Birds Connect webinar. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we've had such a great response to this and we're looking forward to spending some time with you tonight. And we want to especially thank the Community, uh, Community Foundation of Ireland for funding this project. And without this, we, we just couldn't do some of the work we do. Uh, the Birds Connect, it's a new project and we're it's aimed at connecting people and birds and that's through outreach. Uh, webinars like this one and citizen science and we are particularly interested in improving access to um, people with disabilities new communities and minority groups um, you might have seen on our facebook and twitter we're developing a, a laminate guide that's going to go out to direct provision centers um, and we're going to be running a series of webinars throughout the year so just keep an eye on on social media for them um, just the Dawn Corners Chorus, so I mean last year we, were, we just entered lockdown um, during peak Dawn Chorus and many people were, were noticing birdsong much louder and clearer for the first time in a long time. I think birds really represented a freedom and beauty um, and the natural world became such a refuge during, during the lockdown. And this year um, things are beginning to open up and I think it's looking a lot more hopeful um, and so we're just hoping we can all hold on to that interest in birds and learn a little bit more. And tonight we're really delighted to have Niall Hatch, who um, you probably all know from Mooney Goes Wild. He's such a great wildlife uh, communicator. And that's if he's talking to children about common species or if he's talking about complex subjects. So I just wanna say thanks a million to Niall for doing this presentation tonight. And just if everyone wants to sit back with your mug of tea, enjoy this online dawn chorus and I'll hand it over to Niall. That's great Andrew and thank you very much for the for the warm welcome and it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I always say that when I'm not uh, actually out watching birds my favorite thing to do in the world is to talk to people about them and I genuinely mean that uh, and I really love bird song. We have lovely lovely dawn chorus at the moment uh, all over the country. It's really the peak period for that uh, but you don't have to get up early in the morning. There is a dusk chorus as well and of course birds are singing throughout the day and sometimes hearing the birds in isolation is a very good way to get to know them as well. So that, uh, that often is a, is, a, is a good way to do it too. Sometimes the dawn course itself can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and uh, hopefully you can all see it and hear what I have to hear, hear what, I, what I'll be saying. I'll be playing some recordings, of course, as well. Uh, so uh, here we go. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that's now uh, up on your screen and the wren, two of the absolute stars of the dawn course that we have. Uh, so before I get into the nuts and bolts of uh, what birdsong is all about, I just wanted to tell you a little bit, of, first of all, about uh, So of course, we're 19, so we're a few years under the development of this stage. We're the largest and most dedicated to the creation of birds and their habitats across Ireland. Because you can't just protect the birds in isolation, you have to protect all the ecosystem that they depend on, all the different plants and animals that uh, they feed on, that they, they shelter in, that they coexist with, and that therefore it helps us humans as well, because uh, obviously by helping the birds and helping the environment and the ecosystem, we're helping us humans as well, and we're an animal just like any other, and we sometimes lose our turn, it's not just for the birds, Birds for all wildlife and people as well. Uh, we first across Ireland. Uh, I know that many of you here tonight are already members of ours. Uh, for those of you who aren't, I'm hoping I can convince you to join us. So we'll be making uh, a sneaky plug for membership at the end of the talk. So be warned about that. Uh, and hopefully you'll want to support our work. And for those of you who are members of ours, please recruit some friends and family to join us as well. And uh, that does make a big difference. Uh, you know what we do already. Hope you believe in what we do and you can help uh, by to spread the word and help to get more people on board. We have uh, 30 local branches nationwide run by very dedicated and skilled teams of volunteers uh, who do lots of uh, lots of wonderful things uh, all across the country, including running over in normal non-COVID times, more than 450 different events throughout the year. And among those, some of the most popular of all are the, uh, the Dawn Course events that people do, of course. Uh, so um, hopefully we'll be able to return to those next year. I'm certainly keeping my fingers crossed. I've really missed them for the last two years. Uh, and finally, of course, to say we are a registered charity. We're not uh, a branch of the government. We're not a state body or anything like that. We're a fully independent, non-governmental organization. And we rely on um, good people like yourselves for support. Uh, so um, that's what, who we are and what we do. 
So that's enough about Bird Watch Ireland. Now about bird song itself. Why do birds sing? Uh, what's the reason for it? Are they just doing it because they're happy? Uh, do they want to impress us? Are they trying to make us feel calm? Because I know that a lot of people have talk, taken a lot of comfort from, uh, from birdsong uh, during the COVID lockdowns. It's been a real godsend to, to, to myself and, and I'm sure to many of you as well, just enjoying the birds. Uh, but the birds don't care what we think of their songs. Uh, they're singing for a number of very important reasons that are vital to their passing on of their genetic, uh, their genetic material, which is what bird life for birds and most flora and fauna is all about. So the primary reason that they sing, or well, one of the two primary reasons, is to claim and to keep a territory. Uh, so the bird is singing, it wants to have a patch uh, where it'll, uh, it has it exclusively for it and for its partner and for its chicks. It wants to exclude any other members of its own species. And it wants them to know that this is my area. This is this area where I'm singing. This is where I live. You're not welcome here. Uh, and uh, it's a very aggressive thing that they're doing there because what they're saying is to the to the neighboring birds of their own species, if you dare cross this line into my territory, I'm going to fight you, and uh, you know I, I'm going to try to kill you because it's very aggressive to a very aggressive, very macho thing that the birds are doing. Uh, and uh, of course, birds they're able to uh, to judge who might win in a in a fight by how strong the song is. The song is a very important part of what they do. The other thing that they're doing is they're trying to attract a mate, or in some cases, more than one mate, mates plural. Uh, and uh, in that case, what happens is uh, the, the, the prospective partners will be impressed by the bird who, for I suppose for want of the of better term, can waste the better part of their day singing. Because when a bird is singing, uh, it's a clear sign that it's in good health because it's not hiding away from the elements because it's feeling poorly. It's not uh, desperately, uh, you know, desperately trying to find food because it's hungry. It's a sign, therefore, that it's healthy and also its territory is meeting all of its needs. It's giving it adequate shelter. It's giving it uh, adequate food. It's probably protected quite well from predators. Uh, so that's all very, uh, very attractive to a prospective mate. That's uh, that's something that the, the birds uh, very much, uh, very much want to do. Uh, the other thing then that happens as well is that uh, they're trying to proclaim their fitness. That's, that's part of the previous two. They're telling all of their neighbors, I'm in good condition. My voice is strong and loud. I can spend hours singing. So you wouldn't want to fight me. Or if you're a member of the opposite sex, uh, I'm a very good prospect. I have very good genes. Uh, so if we have any offspring together, I'll pass those on to our, to our chicks. Uh, and also I'd be a good provider for you and any chicks that we would have as well, because I can, pr and I can prove it because I'm so strong and loud and I have a great territory. So it's a very serious business for the birds. Then uh, what happens is that Birds will sing throughout the whole day, but it's especially important for them to do that at dawn and at dusk. Most birds don't sing throughout the whole year. They really sing just during the breeding season, so the spring and the summer, essentially. There are some exceptions, uh, but uh, most birds, uh, it's just the spring and summer. And right now, this time in May, is the absolute peak time in Ireland for the dawn chorus. So it's at its absolute finest over the next week or so. Uh, but the birds will continue to sing well into June, and then it kind of peters out a bit. Though some species do sting longer than that. Um, so though they will sing throughout the day but dawn and dusk are the most important times and there's good reason for that uh, one reason that they they'll sing in the evening let's start with the evening first of all before they go to sleep they want to tell all of their neighbors that they're there this is their territory they're fixing their position this is where i am uh, and then the following morning they'll sing to say essentially i've survived i've made it through the night because nighttime is when most birds will die it gets cold they can't feed there's predators around it's a signal to the neighbors I'm still here. This is my territory. You can't have it. If that territory fell silent that morning, the neighboring members of the same species are tuned into that and they would instantly notice, aha, Johnny's dead. I'm going to take his territory. And that's what, uh, that's what happens. So it's, uh, it happens seamlessly. Just with, you know, it can happen just in a few minutes. You wouldn't even notice it happening sometimes. So that's what's going on. It's a very serious business. Another theory about why birds would sing, especially at dawn and dusk, is because it's obviously dark then which means that they can't feed uh, because it's too, it's too dark to actually find food. It's risky because there's predators around as well that they might not see coming. So they're singing then because, well, they may as well do something with that time. Uh, birds sleep remarkably little, uh, various from species to species, but they probably get uh, less than an hour's sleep per 24 hour period. A lot of the time they're just wide awake, perched in the trees and the bushes, just waiting for there to be enough light in the sky for them to sing. And the thing is, it's generally the birds with the largest eyes will tend to start singing uh, early in the morning and later in the evening than the birds with smaller eyes. And there's a very good reason for that. The larger a bird's eye is, the more light it gathers, the bigger the retina. 
Uh, and so therefore it's able to see in lower light levels. And a bird isn't happy to start singing until there's enough light for it to see predators coming. It wants to see danger coming because when it's singing, it's giving away its position to every predator, every cat, fox, hawk, what have you in the neighborhood. So it won't sing until there's enough ambient light for it to see danger coming. And if you have a big eye, you can see a glimmer of light just before dawn. Uh, whereas if you have a small eye, you might have to wait till an hour or even till sunrise itself that's above the horizon before the, uh, the, the, uh, the, you will actually start singing. So it very much de determines, uh, it's determined by how big the eye is. And that means that with the dawn course, there's very much a hierarchy. It starts with just a few species and then builds and builds. So that's one of the things I really like about it. Um, generally, so I should say about birdsong, in most cases, it's limited to the males. It's, in Ireland, it's just the males of most species that sing. There are some exceptions, one very prominent one, which I'll be mentioning later on in the, in the presentation. Uh, this isn't the case, however, in many tropical regions. In many of the tropics, uh, you get both male and female singing. Uh, and very often you'll get duetting performances happening um, in tropical regions of the world. This is very rare within Europe. Uh, however, there are a couple of exceptions, one of which is quite prominent in Ireland, which I will be showing you uh, later on. Uh, and so that's quite interesting. And then note also that songs are different to calls. A bird's call is generally, it's a short little sharp noise or high pitched note or a chirp or a whistle. It's to warn of danger or to keep a flock together, uh, especially during migration um, or to say, you know, the, the, I found food or whatever it may be. They communicate all sorts of information. Both males and females will do that and the young birds as well. Uh, that has nothing to do with impressing a mate or claiming a territory. And so song itself is about claiming a mate and, and, and a territory. That's really what it's about. Uh, so uh, I'm mostly this evening going to be talking about the, the main songs of birds. Uh, bird calls are a different different subject again. Maybe we'll do a talk about those down the line. It's, it's a very important way to, to, to identify birds is from the calls as well. From a lot of our survey work in Birdwatch Ireland, so much of that is done, uh, done by ear rather than by sight. Uh, because uh, birds are often skulking, they're hiding away, they're hard to see. Uh, but if they're singing or they're calling, you can identify those, you get a much better impression uh, of how many of them there are around. And hopefully this evening, if you learn some of the songs that I'm going to play for you this evening, even just a few of them, all of a sudden, hopefully it'll open your, your, your ears to the world of birds and you realize some of these species are actually much more common than you might realize. And some of them might be rarer than you might have thought as well. Uh, so that's a quite an interesting thing. So that's why birds sing. How do birds sing? This is, I won't get too technical. I know this is quite a technical graph from, uh, from uh, some of my friends in the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology in New York, uh, but uh, it, it might seem quite technical. Don't worry about all of the details of it. Just what you need to know is that birds vocal apparatus is quite different from that of humans and indeed our fellow mammals. When I'm speaking to you now, what I'm doing is I'm using my larynx, my voice box, uh, which is essentially in, a, in very basic rudimentary terms. It's a pair of strings like guitar strings or violin strings that are vibrating uh, by air passing over them. I can only make noise when I'm breathing out. So when I'm talking to you now, I'm breathing out, it's vibrating my vocal cords, and then that sound is being amplified by my chest cavity and by my sinuses and by my mouth cavity, and that's projecting outwards. And that's where the sound comes from. But I, if I try to, to talk or make sound when I'm breathing in, it's very, it's almost impossible, pretty much impossible. You can't really do it. For birds, it's quite different. They have a much more efficient vocal mechanism than we do. They don't have vibrating strings. They have a, an, a, a, an object or a, an organ called the syrinx, or sometimes pronounced the syrinx, uh, which is located there, just as you see at the, at the, the junction coming down from the trachea where it, it meets the, uh, the bronchi, which go then to the lungs. And it's, uh, it has muscular walls there and some vibrating membranes in them. Uh, and uh, that's sort of a very technical textbook uh, example of this here. All you really need to know is that there are some vibrating membranes there and uh, they will vibrate whether the air is coming in or going out. So the bird can be breathing in or breathing out, it makes no difference. That's why birds like skylarks can seem to sing for minutes on end. Uh, and they do sing for minutes on end, but people, they seem not to be breathing. People are saying, how is it managing to hold its breath that long or keep breathing out to keep that song going? It isn't. It's breathing in and out constantly. In fact, in some cases, they're hyperventilating by human standards, but still the, uh, the airways are vibrating, uh, those, little, those membranes they have there, and that is making sound. The other thing that birds can do that's incredibly impressive, and I'm sure there'll be many human singers who'd be very jealous of this, this uh, trait, they can control the two tubes independently. They're kind of like organ tubes with a, with a, you know, as in a pipe organ with the vibrating membranes in them. They can control them independently. They can contract uh, the muscles in the walls of those to make them, uh, to make them narrower or they can expand them, make them wider and therefore control the pitch. But they can do each side independently, which means they can produce two notes at once, which means they can harmonize with themselves. 
which is pretty interesting. This is called biphonation, where they're making two sounds at once. And that's why birdsong often sounds so melodic and so rich. There is a harmony happening there and all sort of harmonic overtones are happening. Uh, and that's really fascinating. It's something we humans just can't do. Uh, and so that's why birdsong is so nice and so rich. The other thing that birds can do as well is that many species that have a wide vocal range, they can have one side that's dedicated to high notes and the other side that's dedicated to low notes and they can move seamlessly between them to change pitch. So often if you hear a bird doing a high note, a low note, a high note, a low note, it's alternating the different sides of its syrinx. And that's where the sound is coming from. So I find that really fascinating. And some birds have an incredible vocal range. Uh, there's a bird from North America called the Northern Cardinal, a very common bird in the United States and in Southern Canada, especially in, in the East, a uh, bright red garden bird. They've done some work, very, has a, what seems to our ears a very simple song. It's just a slurred whistle that, that happens very, very quickly. When that is slowed down and then put into, into um, a sonogram or spectrograph machine to show you uh, how the sound is, 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 is generated and how it, how it appears in visual form, what actually is happening in the space of less than a second, that bird is, is covering a greater uh, octave range than a piano. Uh, in just a split second, just by controlling the muscles in the sides of these tubes. It's absolutely amazing they can do this without even thinking of it. So that's something that, that blows my mind. So that's how they do it. Um, so, um, now, let's get on to the nuts and bolts of this, some of the bird songs. I'm going to bombard you with loads of information. Uh, I don't expect everybody to remember all of it by any means. What I hope you'll do is it'll give you some of the tools to help to analyze bird song a bit more, to get to know a few of the birds. And, and then if you know some of the more common species, then at least you have, a, a, you have a, 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 something, you, something you compare it against. You have a comparison for other species. So this blackbird here, when you learn the blackbird song, you might hear this, another song, you might think to yourself, that sounds rather like the blackbird, but it's a bit higher pitched or it's a bit faster or there's more pauses in the middle of it. And um, so it's like a blackbird, it's probably related to a blackbird, but it's different. And that's how you would start to learn the songs. Also, what I would say as well, uh, I'm sure most of you are here this evening because you want to learn some bird songs, but don't lose sight of the fact that the dawn chorus itself is wonderful as an orchestral piece of music. Uh, don't necessarily try to put names to everything. Let the experience wash over you and enjoy it. And um, just as like in an orchestra, uh, you don't have to know which notes are being played by the viola, which are the bassoon, which are the oboe. Uh, you just have to enjoy it as one collective piece of music. And, and the way the bird songs are structured, there are many of them are different frequencies, so they don't compete with each other. So you have this blackbird, which is a fairly low pitched song. And then you have a bird like a, a blue tip, which is higher again. And then you have a bird like a gold crest, which is extremely high. It's like having different frequencies for radio stations. They're not competing with each other. And as far as we're, we, we know, the birds only care about the songs of their own species. The blackbird cares very much if another male blackbird is singing near him, that's a, a declaration of war. But if a, a robin is singing nearby or even in the same territory, he doesn't care. They're not competitors. Uh, they don't compete with each other for mates or for territory or for food. So he'll leave that one be, it doesn't matter. Now, onto the sound of this song. The blackbird, a very common bird, uh, the backbone of the dawn chorus in Ireland. It's very often the first bird to start singing in the dawn chorus in Ireland, and you find them everywhere. You're in your gardens, in woodland, in parks and farms, very common species. And uh, they, start, they have a quite a big eye, so that's one of the reasons why they start singing first thing in the morning. And the song of this bird, it's, um, it's kind of fairly, fairly laid back compared to other birds' songs. I have quite a, these, some of these quite subjective descriptions for songs. I suggest you try and come up with your own that work for you because um, learning bird song is quite diff different, difficult. And I would also say, before I play the song of this bird, the best way of all to learn bird song is to listen to a bird in the wild singing, track it down, look at it through your binoculars, watch it sing, and that somehow fixes it more in your brain that this is the sound that this bird makes. That makes a big difference. Uh, so that's something that I would certainly recommend. Here's the blackbird song here now. Quite fluty. Laid back. Sings a few phrases, then pauses, big long pauses. Often ends with a bit of a flurry of notes. Quite fluty. Low pitched. So I'm just going to pause that there for a second. So you can hear it's quite a low pitched song, which means that it carries quite far. It's like, you know, almost like the bass instruments in a, in a, in a, in a band or in an orchestra. It cuts through and cuts backwards. And when, they, when you have one or two of them singing, you hear it very clearly. But as the dawn chorus progresses, and if you're in an area with lots of blackbirds, it actually becomes sort of like a background hum. It can be hard to distinguish the different blackbirds. Uh, I'm sure they could do it, but the human ear finds it hard. But it becomes the backdrop uh, that sort of anchors or underpins all the other species with higher notes that come in above them. 
and so it really does structure and it's kind of layered like this too. The other thing to say about birdsong, when you're listening to it now uh, on your computers or your tablets uh, or on a CD or on YouTube or whatever, you're obviously hearing it most likely in stereo, uh, which, you know, it, it sounds quite flat from that point of view. In the natural world, it has three dimensions. You'll be able to hear not just if it's coming from the left or the right, but how high up or low down it is physically. Um, you know, so uh, a blackbird, they'll often sing from either fairly high up, medium high to down even relatively quite low in the bushes or high in a tree. They're quite wide. But some other birds will only sing near the ground, some only very high up in the treetops. So that's, a, that's something that, uh, that my talk this evening won't be able to convey in terms of the sound that you're hearing. Uh, so uh, very interesting the way these birds work. So I'll try the, the song there of, the, of the, um, the, the blackbird again, just see if you can hear that flutiness that they have. Long pause between the phrases. And you hear it's different every time. It's like a jazz musician improvising. You never know exactly what it's going to say. But they do have some phrases, or some licks that they repeat. Now, the blackbird is a member of the thrush family. And here's another member of the thrush family. This is the song thrush, uh, a bird that's so good at singing that it's named after its song. Now, the song thrush, uh, it is also one of the first birds to start singing in the morning. Uh, if you look at the size of that eye there, um, it, uh, it really makes a, makes a big difference in terms of the amount of light it can gather. So this bird will sing early in the morning. Its song, it's not dissimilar to the blackbird that you just heard. The song thrush is a little bit smaller. And usually the smaller a bird is, the higher the pitch of the song. Now, there are exceptions to that, but as a general rule, it, it kind of holds. And certainly the song thrush, it's, it's a fluty song still, but it's higher pitched than that of the blackbird. Uh, and it also sounds a little bit more st uh, stressed, I would say. It seems to be more serious. It's more emphatic than the blackbird. The blackbird's kind of laid back, kind of sounding a bit more relaxed, like, like, a, like, a, like as I said, like a jazz musician, maybe. The, uh, the song thrush, it's more hurried, it's more forceful, it's also it's more strident. It also cuts through more. You pay more attention to it. It can be quite loud, but the key to this is that unlike the blackbird, and indeed unlike pretty much any other common Irish songbird, the song thrush repeats phrases in its song. So it'll sing a short phrase. It could be a couple of notes, two, three, four notes maybe. Then often it will repeat that phrase. It may then repeat it a second time, and then it moves on to a new phrase. And then they repeat that it keeps moving on but that repetition for short not not constantly repeating for minutes on end repetition over a short period of time moving on to a new phrase repeating that that is the hallmark of the song first song uh, and they don't often have such long pauses between the phrases of the song as the as the blackbird does as well so repetition is the key to the song thrush so that's how you'll know this one i'm going to play this song for you now listen for how it's shriller than the blackbird a bit more strident, sounds a bit more hassled, uh, and also how it repeats the phrases. Bez in the back there. Hear the repetition. And it cuts through more than the blackbird. It almost reminds you some of them a little bit like an alarm clock. They kind of a wake you up kind of sound. Not like the blackbird. The blackbird's very relaxing, laid back. Okay, so that's our song thrush. So hopefully you've learned those two. Now, I know as time goes on, it'll be hard to remember all of this. Just remember, blackbird, low and fluty, song thrush repeats its phrases. That's how you do those two. Another member of the thrush family, the missile thrush. The missile thrush, in terms of its, its song, it's sort of like a combination of the previous two. It has, um, it has the sort of strident quality of the song thrush, but it doesn't repeat the phrases. But it has the sort of, I suppose, phrasing of the blackbird. Um, so not quite as fluty as a blackbird, a bit more shrill and strident like a song thrush would be, but not repeating the phrases. The best way for me to, to show this to you is, is to play it, of course. Uh, and 
I always think of this bird as sounding quite wild. Also, in the real world, if you're out listening to this, this bird will often be singing from the top of the highest perch it can find. They love to go to the top of the very highest tree or onto a radio mast or something like that. And they sing from higher up than most other birds. That's just the way they do it. And this often will be a bird that's singing even in high wind, even in heavy rain, missile thrushes will still sing. Uh, they're sometimes known by the name of stormcock because they were known to, to sing during bad weather when the other birds are hiding. So here's the song of the missile thrush. See if you can see how to my ears at least, it's sort of approximately a combination of the previous two. sort of laid back a bit like the blackbird which higher pitch like the song thrush no repetition pretty long pauses again like the blackbird Fluty tone, but not as low pitched as the blackbird. And the missile thrush is actually bigger than a blackbird, so it kind of break, breaks the rule we mentioned before. That's our missile thrush. I hope you've learned those three there now. So the three I've just played for you, they tend to be uh, the first three to start singing in the dawn chorus, along with this next fella, um, and this is the robin. Now, I'm being a bit sexist, unfortunately, by saying this fella, because this bird is the exception to the rule that just the male sings. This bird could be a female. Female robins sing as well. And the females break, uh, break another rule. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the whole the rob, both male and female break another rule, uh, because uh, this bird will sing throughout all 12 months of the year. So most birds singing is really just the breeding season, spring and summer. You might get them practicing a little bit other times of the year, but not to the same extent. But the robin keeps a territory year round. Uh, they're very antisocial birds, you see. They don't like each other. They, uh, they'll, they'll fight to the death at any time of the year. And they'll keep that winter territory. The male and female will have separate winter territories, and they sing to defend that. Now, in the winter, their song is very melancholy and wistful. It has a sort of a, uh, it's very fluid and flowing, but a kind of almost a sad kind of air to it. And then as spring comes and it gets into this time of year, then in the summer, the song has sped up and it's much jauntier and the bird sounds happier. This is one of the classic bird songs of Ireland. You hear it all the time. You've probably heard it today already. Uh, and sometimes you'll get, um, uh, you'll get robins even singing at night if you have street lights or porch lights on uh, that tricks their brains into thinking that uh, the sun is about to rise. And so that they start to sing because birds have no control over whether they sing or not. It's a, not a conscious decision to do it. It's prompted by hormones. Uh, and for most birds, those, um, those breeding hormones start surging. It's, it's actually controlled by day length. What happens is as, the, as we get more, uh, more daylight per 24 hour period, this produces hormones in birds. It causes some of them to migrate and it causes many of them then to start singing. And uh, that's when the, they can't control it. The hormones make them do it. With, uh, with robins, they do it throughout the whole year. Uh, so uh, this is the bird that breaks the rules. So with this song, I'm going to play it for you now. You may know this. It's kind of like the classic Irish bird song. You hear it everywhere. Uh, but I always think of it as being, it's a bit like a bit like a blackbird in some sense that's been sped up. A more hurried blackbird. It's higher pitch, but still has a fluty quality to it. But it's throwing in far more notes uh, in, in, than each of the, the birds we've heard up until now. It's much faster. It sounds like it's more, in more of a hurry. Um, so let's, let's hear that now. Let's see if it works. Very twittery. Chip chat in the back. Jack does. So twittery phrases, faster than blackbird, but big pauses between the phrases. Far more notes than any of the thrushes thrown into each phrase. And again, it seems to be improvising. It's never the same tune. So that's our robin. So that's, so that's one that I would really recommend getting to, to learn. And uh, so just to recap very quickly for what we've done so far, because I won't keep recapping because it gets more complicated as we go on. But the ones to learn from the dawn chorus would be the blackbird, low and fluty, long pauses between the phrases. Then we have the song thrush, 
higher pitched, more sh shrill and strident, repeats the phrases and moves on to a new one, repeats that, then moves on. Uh, and not so many gaps between the phrases. The missile thrush kind of like a hybrid between the previous two. It's, it's kind of um, sort of more laid back like the blackbird. Uh, it has more of the tonal quality though of the song thrush, a bit more shrill, but it doesn't repeat the phrases. Then we have the robin, like a sped up blackbird, more notes thrown in, but still improvising that song and there's long pauses between the phrases. So the, the pauses may last as long as the phrase did. And so that's a good way to tell them apart. So if you can get to grips with those four, they now give you a benchmark against which you can judge the songs of all the other birds. And that's really the key to it. Then at least you recognize that well, it sounded like a robin, but it was actually a more simple song or it was a scratchier song. That's a very good way to do it. So that's what I would recommend. So on to our next bird. That's the wren. Now the wren is a ubiquitous bird in Ireland. There are more wrens in Ireland than human beings. They outnumber us. There are probably at least 6 million of them nesting on this island right now. And that's not counting all the babies that are about to emerge from their nests. Uh, life is short though, most of those babies don't survive uh, very long and very few make it to their first birthday. Uh, life is tough for them. And so that means that if you do make it to your first birthday and you're, you're ready to breathe, they're fully adult at that stage, well, you might not see a second birthday. So you better get down to nesting. And they take it very seriously because it might be the only chance they have to pass their genes on to the next generation. So they sing very, very prominently and loudly. And very often they're tucked inside a bush and usually quite low down. This isn't the song you'll hear coming from the treetops. It'll be coming maybe from hip height or maybe as high as shoulder height, but not much higher than that. And the thing, the way to recognize this song is it's almost absurdly loud. For such a small bird, the second smallest bird in Ireland, this bird is exceptionally loud. It's over 80 decibels. It's one of the loudest songbirds that we have. If one was to start singing uh, beside you, uh, you'd almost jump with fright if you didn't know it was there because it really is quite startlingly loud. Uh, and it's also one of the birds that each year when we do uh, the Dawn Chorus broadcast with RT Radio 1 with Derek Mooney, I, Sunday before last, I was doing that with him down in Cuscany Marsh Nature Reserve in Cork. We're very proud to do that. But when we're setting up the microphones for that, we have to work out where the, the wren territories are so we don't put the microphones directly near their song posts, because if they do sing there, it just blows out the, the whole sound for the, for, for, for the bone chorus at that stage. It's so loud that it distorts and the microphone calibration goes all off. So that's, we have to be very careful with them. They're so loud. It's a very, very rapid stream of notes. It doesn't, seem, it doesn't last all that long, just a, you know, over a second, two seconds maybe, not very long. But in that, there's over 300 separate notes. It's far faster than even the most virtuoso violinists could, could, could manage. It's throwing all sorts of things in. You'll never learn what the song is. It's listening for the loudness of it, how long and varied it is. And then also listen for the trill in it. There's always what I call the machine gun rattle in the middle of this song, sort of a kind of sound somewhere in that song, usually towards the end, but it could be in the middle. But uh, that's something to listen out for. So I'll play this for you now. This is the song of the wren, a ubiquitous bird in Ireland, and one that is really loud. Hit the trill there at the end. You couldn't possibly count the notes. It's far too fast. You might hear that blackbird in the back. We've learned that one now. Really loud, forceful song. And the bird's whole body shakes with the effort of making that song. It's incredible how loud it is. Uh, a friend of mine who works for the, the Macaulay Library of Natural Sounds in um, Cornell University, he once played me a sound of a, a related species to this, a bird called the winter wren from North America. It looks almost identical. If you heard the song, you'd know it was the sound of a wren. It's a very similar song. And he, he slowed it down. Um, so when you, see, when you slow something down, it lowers the pitch. But you could hear like each, each individual note. And when it was slowed down enough, it sounded astonishingly like the song of the humpback quail. Now, a humpback quail and a wren, they're not two species you're really going to confuse with each other in the wild. But it really was very interesting because, of course, their songs would serve a similar purpose. They're trying to attract a mate. They're trying to lay claim to a certain area. That's what they're doing. It's just obviously the humpback whale, it's very low pitch, so it carries over a longer distance. Uh, but it was remarkably similar. So I thought that was just a fascinating thing. That's the wren. Very strong, very loud, very rapid song, uh, very strident, one that you'll hear all the time. Uh, if, you were to, if you were to go out tomorrow morning, you'll hear wrens. They're everywhere. Where you get wrens, you get this bird. This is the dunnock. Uh, the dunnock is another bird that's uh, very common in Ireland. 
uh, features quite prominently in the dawn chorus as well, although it's usually not one of the earliest risers. It tends to be sort of um, the middle part of the dawn chorus, has quite a small eye, as you can see there. So all the previous birds we've just shown you, they'll be singing before the dunnock starts. And hopefully when you're hearing the dawn chorus in real time, you'll be able to get to grips with those ones and then you'll hear the dunnock come in. The dunnock, if you look at it there, it's a bird that kind of steps below the radar. It's kind of brown and streaky, not really much to describe there. It's kind of a, an innocuous kind of camouflage looking little bird. It usually hides in the bushes as well, quite low down like the wren. Also, its song isn't terribly remarkable. I'm sure for the female dunnock, they absolutely love it uh, because with the species, like most of them, it's just the male that sings. But the song to our ears is quite thin and scratchy and meandering. Nothing wrong with it. It doesn't, it doesn't sound particularly amazing. You kind of wouldn't really remark upon it. There's a scratchy quality to it, very thin, scratchy quality compared to the, the richness of the previous birds that we've just heard. And if you also hear it, there, there isn't too much of a range of pitch. It's not going very high or very low. It's kind of like, staying to the middle, just wobbling up and down a little bit in terms of pitch. So I'll play it for you now. This is the scratchy pin song of the Dunnock. Quite long pauses again. And a thin sound, it's not very forceful. It can, be, it can be quite loud if you're near it, but it doesn't have that richness of, of the previous birds. You're not gonna, it doesn't sound like a flute by any, by any means. Um, it, um, so that's, um, that's how I'd recognize that one, that thin scratchiness, not very melodic. There are other birds that have scratchy songs that tend to throw in other kind of whistles and notes. This bird never whistles or makes sort of bold um, harmonizing kind of notes. It, it just has a thin scratchy song throughout. So that's the song of the dunnock. Again, usually given from in cover, they hide when they sing. This here is the bullfinch, a beautiful little bird. Uh, bullfinch is unlike most of our songbirds. Bullfinch is mate for life. And uh, so when you see the male here with his red chest and the gray back, if you look around, you'll usually see the female within a few meters. She's never far from his side and they're often hanging around together. So that means that his song doesn't have to be very loud because it doesn't have to travel very far. The female he's, in try he's trying to impress is right beside him uh, and he wants to proclaim a territory, uh, but he doesn't have to make too big a deal about it because bullfinches, they're, they're not as maybe as common as some of the previous birds, although it's not a rare bird. But because they pair for life, there isn't so much competition. Once you found your mate there, you're, you're set. So their song, it's very simple and very quiet. Uh, so of all the songs we've heard so far, this is the most simple and uh, there's not very much to it at all. And you have to be within a few meters of it or you won't hear it. It's usually given from inside a, a bush or a hedge. Uh, this bird isn't perched very prominently when it's doing it. And to me, it always sounds like it's slightly sad. Uh, obviously, uh, I use these sort of emotional cues just to help me remember the bird song. The bird it probably isn't sad. Uh, we have no way of knowing. Uh, but uh, it just sounds kind of sad. So what do you think? It's a very simple song. That's it. Down slurred. Phew, phew. Kind of mournful. And compared to all the birds we've heard so far now, that wouldn't be very impressive to human ears. Again, I'm sure to a female uh, bullfinch, that's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but uh, it's far less complex than the previous ones. Um, and just a note about the complexity of songs. Uh, most of our songbirds, uh, they actually don't innately know their songs. They have to learn them from their fathers. And it, 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 they learn them at a different age, depending on the age of the bird, but it's usually when they're still in the nest. And that's one of the reasons why birds, if they're hand reared as nestlings, it's one of the reasons why they have a very hard time surviving in the wild because they never learn the correct song of their own species. So they don't know if they're encroaching on a rival's territory because they don't recognize that song. If they're a male bird, they don't know the correct song to sing. So no female will ever be impressed by them because they'll sound wrong. And if they're a female bird, they won't know what to look out for in a prospective mate because they've never heard the correct song of their species. Now we know that bullfinches can be, if they're raised in captivity, they can be taught far more complex songs than this. Mozart, of all people, used to keep bullfinches and teach them to sing his music. And they can learn a much more complex song than what you just heard there. And he used to get a kick out of this. Mozart was quite a weird guy. He used to get a, get a kick out of this. Um, and you know, quite an interesting little parlor trick, I suppose. Uh, but um, in the wild, 
they don't learn a complex song. That simple song is all that they need. In fact, it's, I think it's simple. It's deceptively simple. If you, if you look at it, uh, analyze the different frequencies, there's quite a frequency range in that down spurred whistle. It's going from quite a high pitch note to quite a low pitch note in a very short space of time. So the actual muscle control that that, that requires um, is, is, is actually very complex. And that's why they have the, the ability to learn other pieces of music if they're trained with them. But that's one of the reasons why birds, um, uh, why raising songbirds is often a disaster because they can't learn the song. There are other birds, however, that don't learn their song. Well, they, they innately know it. And I'll show you some of those a little later on. But just for, as a general rule, most of the birds you hear in the dawn chorus have had to learn that song. And that means you get regional dialect differences the same way with human language and with human accents. So a chaffinch in, in Cork might sound different to a chaffinch in Belfast and certainly sounds different to a chaffinch, let's say, in somewhere like uh, Germany or the Czech Republic. And um, not so much the bullfinches, although northern bullfinches up in um, up in Scandinavia, they're a bit bigger and they often have a, a different call note altogether, a different component of their song that sounds like a toy trumpet. So there are variations. Blackbirds here might sound different to blackbirds in, let's say, Russia. Uh, but some other birds learn, don't learn their songs and they remain the same. So I'll give you an example of that shortly. Now, I mentioned the chaffinch just now because this is one of the quintessential singers that we have. The chaffinch, one of the most common birds in Ireland. They outnumber human beings again, like the wren. They're all around us. Many people don't know them. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's surprising how little known this gorgeous bird is. But you know this bird's song. You've been hearing it all of your life. And uh, this, uh, this bird, it's, it's the quintessential sound of spring in Ireland. And they're in fine voice at the moment as well. You'll hear them in the dawn chorus. Not one of the earliest risers, but sort of midway through the dawn chorus, they start up and they don't stop. For the rest of the day, they'll be singing intermittently. Most of these birds will sing throughout the day, but nothing like to the same degree they do in the dawn chorus, not, not so frequently. This bird's song is best described as being a series of notes that go down a scale in steps and then end in a flourish. And sometimes that flourish is slurred upwards or slurred downwards. But unlike the species we've just heard now, this up until now, this bird's song is kind of fixed. It doesn't vary the, the tune that it sings to any meaningful degree. It's what we call a stereotyped song. So if the, um, if the, the blackbird was um, the jazz musician that's improvising freely, uh, then the chaffinch is an orchestral musician that's sticking to the sheet music. Uh, so that's a good way. So once you learn this song, this is one of the first of the songs I want to show you, where you if you learn the song, uh, you'll recognize it every time. So a descending series of notes ending in a flourish. Now, hopefully there'll be some recognition. Once you hear the song, I'm hoping some people will go, oh yeah, I know that bird. That's a, that's a chaffinch. Okay, this is the song of the chaffinch. Going down in steps on the same pitch, down again. The slur flourish at the end. That bird is slurring down. Sometimes they slur up at the end. And strangely, in um, some parts of Europe, particularly in places like in, in Eastern Europe, very often, like Poland, for example, or Russia, very often at the end of that song, the chaffinch is there, I add a note that sounds very like the call of a great spotted woodpecker, like a kick note at the end of that. So there's all these different dialect differences. Uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's really fascinating. We did an interesting experiment with this bird a couple of years ago on the RT Radio 1 Dawn Chorus because the chaffinch is found all across Europe. Uh, and it's not one of the first birds to start singing in the Dawn Chorus, it sings later. So what we were able to do, because we had live feeds from going right the way from Moscow right across to, to, to Galway, what we were able to do is we were able to go to the local correspondents when their first chaffinches started singing. Uh, and as we predicted, they would start first in Russia because that is obviously where the sun has risen already. Dawn comes there earlier because it's, it's, uh, it's further to the east. And then we could have that wave of chaffinch song moving across Europe, moving westward until it reached Galway and Cork. And what we were actually doing there in real time, we were listening to essentially the sound of the earth turning on its axis because the earth was spinning, rotating, bringing it in the outer shadow into the sunlight. And that was what prompting the chaffinches to sing. And you could actually time that and it went like a like clockwork, like a wave at a steady pace across Europe. It's really very interesting to do that. So hopefully there you know now the song of the chaffinch, descending series of notes, going a little step, then down a step, a few notes, down a step, and a flourish at the end. That's the song there of the chaffinch.
Now, this here is a beautiful bird called the yellowhammer, a species that is now uh, much rarer in Ireland than it used to be. Uh, it's a victim of um, agricultural intensification, changes in land use, habitat destruction, disappearance of hedgerows. It's a bird that very much depends on tillage farming and particularly on winter stubble or winter wheat. And that doesn't happen so much now. So this is a bird that was once, uh, a few generations ago, would have been abundant across Ireland. Everyone would have known this bird. Now it's, it's very much tied to areas where there's tillage farming and it's particularly Eastern Leinster. So uh, in Border Ireland's head office in uh, Kilcoolin County, Wicklow, we have one of these singing in our car park every summer, uh, but uh, go uh, elsewhere further west, they're harder to find, particularly west of the Shannon. There are a few pockets of them, but they're harder to find. And in Northern Ireland, they're few and far between. Again, a few pockets of them, but not very many. Now, uh, the, the, the Yellowhammer, uh, it sings a, a very interesting song. It's a good way to identify them is by their song. They carry quite a long way, but it has, again, one of these stereotyped songs uh, that always remains the same. Sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower, but it always follows the same pattern. And one of the main reasons I included this bird is because it has one of the most famous, perhaps infamous uh, memory devices to try and help you know, to identify the song. Sometimes you can put them in sentences or words. So you can, uh, sometimes people come with a little phrase, Sometimes it will work for one person, won't work for another. Sometimes they're written down in bird books and field guides, and that's very diff difficult because it's so subjective. Everyone's accent is different. They might put stresses on different words or different syllables. So infamously, the song of the Yellowhammer in books is very often described as saying a little bit of bread and no cheese. A little bit of bread and no cheese. Now, when you hear it, to my ears, it doesn't sound like that at all. I see where they're coming from. It's kind of like a rhythm and then cheese rather. It's more like little bit of bread and no cheese like this little bit of bread and no cheese like that and sometimes the slurring of the cheese goes up and down the, the, the actual that slurred cheese note at the end it sounds very much like a rusty gate swinging on the hinges and um, it's, it's a very odd sound sometimes it's faster sometimes it's slower and sometimes all you hear from a distance is the slurred note the cheese at the end so i'll play it for you now maybe this sounds exactly to you like a little bit of bread and no cheese um but maybe you can come up with something better for yourselves whatever works for you this is the yellow hammer song Okay, so maybe a little bit of bread and no cheese. You know what I mean? It's, it's a da -da 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 yep, like that. That's the song of the Yellowhammer. The Yellowhammer is a member of the bunting family. There are many other buntings um, across Europe and Asia as well. And um, they, many of them have similar songs. So there's a bird called the Searle bunting, which sims, sings a very similar song, but without that slur at the end. There's a bird called the Ortolan bunting, which sings a similar song, but it's up and down a bit. You go, didr, 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 yeep, like that. So that's when you know one song, when you're traveling, it can help you identify. That's probably a bunting singing, but it's a little different to the yellow hammer. Now, the other bunting that we have that breeds in Ireland uh, is this. This is the reed bunting. This is a species that has quite a different song, even though it's quite closely related to the yellow hammer. Despite its name, it's not confined just to reed beds. It, it is common in reed beds, but they'll often go into, into thickets and, and, and sedges and scrub and, and weedy fields, those kind of things. So it's not just, uh, particularly where the ground is wet, but not just reeds. Uh, and it is often best located by its song as well. If it is in a reed bed, it'll often sing quite prominently, perch on a high stem and it will sing. Its song, again, it's one of those stereotype songs that's a little difficult to describe. It's kind of hesitant. It sounds like it's not quite so sure of itself. And uh, uh, one, one thing that kind of works for me when I hear it, it's almost like it's kind of saying its name. It sort of goes reed bunting, reed bunting, like this. Nah, 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 nah. Or sometimes some people say it sounds a bit like a roadie doing a microphone check uh, you know, at a gig. So it's a bit like it's going check, one, two, one, two, check, check, one, two. It's kind of hesitant. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, so that's what the way what happens there. So I'm going to play for you now the uh, the uh, the lovely song of well it's not a lovely subjective I quite like it the song of the the reed bunting. For some reason this one is this recording is quite quiet. So you might have to listen quite carefully or even just temporarily turn up your speakers. It's not working for me. One second. I'm sorry, wrong one. It's going wrong on me here now. So someone's written something on the screen, actually, and it's causing havoc. Um, there we go. Maybe this will work. There we go. Read one thing. Read one thing. Like 
And with this species, habitat is going to be a clue as well. This bird is not going to be singing from, not going to be singing from the canopy in a woodland. Um, in most people's gardens, it's not going to be there unless you may have a very wet patch down the back of the garden with lots of like, high vegetation. Uh, but if you're at a reed bed and you hear that reed, reed, bunting, that's a quite, quite distinctive and you can very easily hear them there. Uh, I went this morning to Bird of East Coast Nature Reserve, uh, which uh, Andrew is the, is the warden of, and uh, there's quite a few of those singing in the reed beds there at the, at the moment. Um, nice thing to listen to. So that's, that's the reed bunting. Okay, on to our next bird. This is a member of the warbler family. It's one of the leaf warblers, one of the philoscopus warblers. Philoscopus means leaf inspector. Uh, they, check, they check the other side of the leaves looking for insects. And they can be very difficult to identify because there are several different warblers that look very, very similar. So uh, this, uh, this is a willow warbler. Uh, and there's various ways to tell that. Um, with experience, I can tell the facial patterns. Is, it sounds like a willow warbler. It's kind of quite yellow. If you can see the length of the wings, which of course you can't in this picture with the wingtips, they often help to separate it from another very close related species called the chiff chaff. However, their songs are utterly different. So what happened is these are two closely related birds that instead of having evolved many physical differences between each other, they've evolved uh, sound differences. The songs are completely different and that's how they can tell each other apart very easily. And that's actually the case in many of the tropics. There are lots of birds, little small brown birds that look very, very similar to each other but have very different songs. Uh, and that's the case therefore with this pair here, the willow warbler and the chiff chaff, which I'll show you just in a moment. So the willow warbler, how would I describe this song? It has a similar quality in some ways to the chaffinch that we heard earlier, that descending series of notes that are going down the scale. But it's not so strident as that. The willow warbler sounds, to my ears at least, it sounds like it's kind of a bit more laid back. It reminds me of the sound of a leaf kind of fluttering down from the trees, fluttering down and hitting the ground. And what happens is it kind of runs out of steam towards the end. So it starts off well enough and then sort of just goes, oh, I can't be bothered with this and runs out at the end, going down all the time. So this is the song of the willow warbler. Going down. So it runs out of steam at the end. Doesn't have that big flourish that the chaffinch has. Just kind of runs out of steam. Fluttering down all the time. So going down the scales. So that's the willow warbler. Now, the next bird I'm going to show you, the chiff chaff, looks extremely similar. This is the chiff chaff. Okay. Um, it's generally got darker legs than the willow warbler, although there are sometimes exceptions. Um, uh, it has shorter wings because it's a shorter distance migrant. Willow warblers migrate to sub Saharan Africa, while the, the chiff chaffs uh, tend to just go no further than maybe than the Mediterranean basin. They don't cross the, uh, the Sahara Desert. Uh, uh, but you find them often in very similar habitat. Uh, you, you find them, you know, they're, they're both abundant birds in Ireland. Um, the, the willow warbler we just saw, there's more than a million pairs of those breeding in Ireland right now. It's a real bird watcher's bird. The general public aren't aware of them at all. But you can find them all over the place. Um, you can find them particularly in woodland. Uh, so the song of the chiff chaff, it's named after its song. It, here's the song. It just says chiff chaff chaff chip chip chaff chaff chip chip chaff. And then it pauses, or it sounds like it pauses. If you're very close, it's actually making little tiny little little staccato notes. It goes do 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 do. Chiff, chaff, chaff, chiff, chiff. So it's not really pausing at all, but you have to be very close to hear the little doo -doo 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 between the phrases. Um, so the name, chiff, chaff. Here it is. Here's the song of chiff, chaff. Utterly different from, uh, from the one we just heard and one of the easiest Irish bird songs to identify. So you'll go away from this talk. If nothing else, you'll be able to identify a chiff, chaff. I guarantee you. Oh, that, that went wrong. <laughs> Sorry about this. I have to go back. There's something been written on the screen, you see, and that's causing, it, it, it means that I'm having a difficulty in actually getting the, there we are, having difficulty in actually playing the, the, uh, the clips. Let's try that one more time. Give it a staccato note. Pick it, pick it. Chiff, chaff, chaff, chiff. So you can hear the difference between that and the willow warbler, completely different. Chiff Chaff says its name. That's something that, by the way, has been recognized in many different cultures and languages. So in, in Irish, the name of this bird is Chiff Chaff. In, uh, in German, it's Zilpsalp. Uh, and it's even been recognized in its scientific name, which is one of my favorite scientific names of any creature on the planet. 
Uh, so the, the, the Latin name for this bird is, is Philoscopus colibetus. So Philoscopus, as I said before, the whole genus of warblers call that. It means essentially leaf inspector. They look at leaves trying to find food. This bird often flutters around in the trying the trees trying to find food on the leaves. The second part of the name is, is lovely though, colibeta. It's, a, it's, a, it's Latinized Greek, and it comes from the Greek word for a money lender or a money changer, because the song of this bird was supposed to resemble the sound of someone counting out coins on a table. Chiff, chuff, chuff, chiff, chiff, chuff, chuff, chiff, chiff. So, uh, uh, so the, the philosopher's colibita, it means uh, leaf inspecting money changer. So that's, uh, that's what it means. Uh, so um, that's a really charming little bird. Hopefully now you can easily tell the difference between willow warblers and chiff chaffs, at least by ear. Uh, the blue tit, we had a sneak preview of him just a second ago. Uh, the blue tit there is, um, is uh, a bird that, again, very common in Ireland. There's 1.1 million pairs of them nesting right now. It's right at the peak of their nesting season right now. Uh, and uh, they're remarkable little birds. They have a song that I would describe as being very, very hurried. It sounds like they're almost uh, agitated that they're scolding you. Now, members of the tit family, they have a great wide vocal repertoire. A lot of work's been done on this family particularly their, their relatives they're called the chickadees in North America, which are, are members of the same family. And they found that these birds, their songs can be so complex that it actually borders on language. They seem to have a syntax, there's actual grammar to the way they work, and they're able to convey information through their songs. We can't speak that language, but there is information being transferred. And um, so the songs aren't just random. Uh, but in general, this bird sounds, has many different sounds that it makes, but the main sound that it makes, it sounds like it's, um, it sounds like it's, it's a bit angry with you, or you've annoyed it, it's a bit narked. Um, so here it is. It's a song that you, you've, heard, you've heard before, I'm sure. See, 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 see. Usually high notes at the start, then a longer trill almost at the end. Let's play that one more time, do you? That's the song of the blue tit. Now it makes other sounds as well and can vary that up a bit, but that kind of scolding, very simple song, but that kind of scolding nature to it um, is, uh, is really the key to it. And I say a simple song, it's simple to our ears, but bear in mind that there is information being conveyed there. They're able to say there's a predator over there or you know, there's something going on there. It's, it's not as simple as it sounds really to the human ear. So that's the, uh, that's the blue tit. Now we go on to the great tit now. The great tit, um, a fine singer. It sings many different songs. And the sort of, uh, uh, this one, it's very often, you, you get to know the sort of the pitch or the way that they behave, you know, that must be a great tip song. But the fact is, for bird watchers who've been learning uh, about birds for many years and studying them, listen to, lot, learn lots of bird song, there's sort of a general rule of thumb. If you're in an Irish woodland and you hear a bird song that you don't recognize, nine times out of 10, it'll be a great tip doing something weird. And um, they often do that. And what they do is they'll sing a song form, you know, it's usually quite a simple song, but they sing a few phrases, repeat them, repeat them over and over. Not like the song's worth, the song's worth repeats a phrase once, maybe twice, then moves on to a new one. The great tit sounds like it gets stuck in a rut, it's going and going and going. Then all of a sudden it'll change that song and the neighboring great tits will pick up on that and they'll start repeating that same song. So they change, they, they change the songs depending on what their neighbors are doing and they try to match them. So it's quite interesting. So it's impossible to learn all the songs of the great tit here and now, but I will play the most common one for you. And it's one of the easiest to identify. It's called the teacher song because they basically go teacher, 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 like this, two notes up and down. Uh, to me, by the way, I often call it the bicycle pump song because it sounds very like someone using a bicycle pump. So see what you think. Teacher, 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 or bicycle pump. That's that. I could go on doing that all day. So um, that's and, and the, by the way, the um, let's start it again. <laughs> the uh, the uh, great tip. It, uh, it 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 will sing in the dawn course, but it'll also sing throughout the day. It's not so closely tied to singing early in the morning and late in the evening. It's happily singing throughout the day, and um, so um, you could hear it any time. Third member of this family here now, this is the coal tit. And um, again, a bird with a wide vocal repertoire, often heard singing from coniferous trees, although that's not a, not a hard and fast rule. It could be anywhere, but they do, they do love conifers. And um, the best way to remember this, it has the same sort of variety in many ways as the great tit, but it's, it's higher pitched, more shrill and faster. So it's like a great tit that's been sped up and therefore raised the pitch of it. See what you think. Three notes in that one, but it could be two, it could be three. 
I'm just going to pause it there and you can hear here the origin of the name chickadee for the, the tits that are found in North America for many of them. It's like they go chickadee, 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 chickadee. And this, this bird does the same. Chickadee, 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 chickadee. Really high, quite, quite a high pitched squeaky sound. So that's the song of the cult. Now I know at this stage I've bombarded you with loads of bird songs, but I hope you're starting to learn at least some of the tools on how you can identify them and tell them apart. There's a few more to go though. This is the long-tailed tit. Now the long-tailed tit, they live in sort of family groups their whole lives. You, know, you never see them on their own or rarely ever. They're usually in groups of like a dozen or 20 birds. They sort of move through in a wave and sort of a, fee a feeding flock. Uh, and because they live in these little social family groups, they're not defending a territory in the same way. They're defending a family territory but, uh, or, or uh, a nesting area, but they're not really competing with each other directly. So their songs and their calls are kind of the same. They have the same sort of function. They're about keeping up family relationships and keeping close together um, because you'll have many, many uh, parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters all together in the same flock and they're communicating with each other all the time. So their songs, they, well, their song and their call, you could use the, the, the same for both. There are two different main ones. One is a very, very high pitched little, little seep, seep, seep kind of sound, seep, 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 they often go seep, seep, seep like this. And they often have a sort of a strange sort of rattle as well. Very odd, I can't do a very good impression of it, but I don't need to, because I'm gonna play it for you here now. Listen for all the, this is the sound of a flock of long tail tits all making different sounds together. There's some main ones you always hear. This is how you identify long tail tits. You hear the sound overhead and you look up, you'll see the long tail tits. Best way to find them. Like that. You hear the CCC in the back as well. That's long tail tit as well. So we're getting towards the realm of birds that have very high pitched songs. That are very high pitched indeed, and and that's that sort of leads to another another group of birds. I the ones I like to think of the high pitched ones. So that's your long tail tit. But listen for those churring notes they make as well. Now this here is another bird that has a very high pitched song. Flying too early for me there. This is the tree creeper. A bird that can be very hard to see because they're quite common, but they what they do is they uh, go up the, the bark of trees. They're, they're, they look like bark. Uh, they, they camouflage very well. So it'll be hard to see them. And they often sing from very high up in a tree. And the best way to find them is by their high pitched song. In some ways it reminds me a bit of the song of the willow warbler, that descending leaf, um, because it's a sending series of notes, but it's extremely high pitched. And you usually get them high up in a tree. So see what you think. I'll play it for you here. This is a song with the tree creeper. Again, the best way to find the species is to listen to the song. High pitch, but coming down all the time. So descending, but starting up very high pitch. With these birds, we're getting to the stage where you know the bird sings at a very high, very high pitch. That's how you identify that. And here's one of the highest pitched of all. This is Ireland's smallest breeding bird. This is the gold crest, a bird best best located by its song. It's a very common bird. Again, often sings like the colted from coniferous trees, often very high up. And the song is the best way to detect them. Just to say that the song of this bird is so high pitched, it's at the very edge of human hearing ability. The frequency is so high that, in fact, some people can't hear it. Uh, and uh, uh, quite a few people over the age of 60 are incapable of, incapable of hearing this. Um, it, can happen, it can happen at any age, but most children can hear it well. Um, so I'm going to play the song for you now. If you don't hear anything coming out of your speakers, um, I'm afraid you're not able to hear the, this high a pitch anymore. Uh, but the fact is that um, it, 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 when you do hear it, it's very, very distinctive. It's, um, it's kind of sounds, sounds to me like a squeaky wheel spinning round and round, like tweedly, 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 but very, very high pitch. As I said, the very limit of what a human ear can hear. Little squeaky wheel spinning round. Some people say it sounds like it's going tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. Tea kettle. 
So hopefully you managed, most of you managed to hear that at least. That was the song of the gold crest. Again, because they're so small, they're so high up in the trees, um, it's very hard to, to see them. Uh, so pick up that song is the best way to, to locate them. And just my favorite fact about this bird um, is that uh, it's not only our, our smallest bird, it's our lightest bird in Ireland. This bird weighs five grams. And to put that in context for you, a 20 cent coin weighs six grams. So this bird weighs less than a 20 cent coin, which I find just mind blowing. Now, all the birds that I've shown you up until now are the birds that have learned their songs from their, from their parents, usually from the father throughout their lives. We have, and they usually have the most complex songs. There are, however, a group of birds which actually have their songs genetically coded, hardwired into their brains. Uh, and they just know how to sing them automatically without anyone teaching them. So this bird here is a wood pigeon. If it was raised in captivity, um, it would still sing the correct song because it's all in its DNA. It doesn't have to learn anything. And that means that wood pigeons sound the same no matter where you are. All across their range, and they go all the way across uh, from, from Western Europe right across to India, they sound exactly the same. You'd instantly know it's a wood pigeon because it's genetically coded. Now, this bird, it's responsible each year for lots of letters to newspapers like the Irish Times from people saying, it was the 1st of February and I just heard a cuckoo. Is this a record? And I always want to write back and say, no, but it was almost certainly a mistake. Uh, what you were hearing was either a wood pigeon or the next bird, the collared dove, because it makes a cooing sound that carries quite far. Uh, my, my general rule of thumb is that if you have to ask yourself if the bird you heard was a cuckoo or not, then it wasn't a cuckoo, because when you hear the real thing, there is no mistaking it. And I'll have that for you now in a few minutes. I have the sound of a cuckoo here to play for you. I want to show you the wood pigeon, though. It sings uh, a, a pattern of five notes. It has always follows the same pattern. It has a pattern of five notes. You hear it sort of hailing, pumping up the air sacs inside this body. It starts with a wheezing sound and then launches into the series of five cooing notes um, with a very specific emphasis. So it goes, I'll make a fool of myself saying it, but here's what it sounds like. It goes, coo Ooh, ooh. So the emphasis on the second syllable, pause after the third syllable. So, ooh, 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 ooh. and sometimes the books write that down as take two, John, take two, take two, John, take two. So that's the way people sometimes remember. So nothing like a cuckoo. So I'm going to play it for you now. This is the sound of the wood pigeon. Hopefully many of you said, oh, that's it. I hear a chiff chaff in the back there. Going chiff chaff chaff chiff chiff. So that's the song of the wood pigeon. Coo -woo 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 -woo. Now the collared dove, common bird across Ireland, but only colonized Ireland for first appeared here in 1959. Uh, and within 10 years of that was breeding in every county in Ireland. And now it's one of our top 20 most common garden birds. And um, it has a strange call about the male and female. Like it's a strange sort of sneezy wheezing sound. It doesn't sound like a pigeon or a dove at all. But the song is quite different. It's reminiscent of the wood pigeon but it's in a pattern of threes. And some people say it sounds a bit like a football chant. It's, you know, see what you think. I'll play it for you and then you hear the football chant. You know it, you know it. That's the sound of the collared dove, that pattern of three notes, coo woo woo, as opposed to coo woo 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 of the wood pigeon. Okay, so they're the species that are responsible for people thinking they're hearing cuckoos each February when they aren't. This is the cuckoo. It's a bit pigeon like, actually, it tends to mimic a sparrow hawk. That seems to be no coincidence. They've evolved to look like sparrow hawks, so the females will flush up the, the host species and find out where their nests are. And um, the cuckoo, when you hear the real thing, there is no mistaking it. Um, it's, it's, two perfectly clear notes that form a minor third uh, in musical terms between them. And it's cuckoo, cuckoo, nothing really like the ones we just heard. Let's hear this. And this is the bird, of course, that proves that it doesn't learn its song from its father, because, of course, the cuckoo never meets its father. Uh, the father is long gone and has probably left for Africa by the time that the, the bird would be old enough to be to be learning, uh, to be learning uh, any songs. 
that's totally encoded into its brain. Uh, so it'll sing that tune um, no matter uh, who raised it, what, what the host species. And indeed, if it did learn its song, it might accidentally learn the song of its foster father, uh, the unwitting foster parents that it has, and then sing the wrong song completely. So this is totally coded into its brain. What's also coded into its brain is its migratory route. It has a natural GPS built into it, so it knows where to migrate. It knows where the cuckoos go. It knows how a cuckoo is supposed to behave. No cuckoo ever teaches it how to behave. Uh, if you've been lucky enough to hear a cuckoo uh, this year, uh, we all ask people every year, when you, when you hear or see your first cuckoo of the year, if you log it for us at springalive.net, we'd be very grateful, springalive.net. And you can also log your first uh, swift, swallow, sand martin, and ringed plover of the year for the Spring Alive project there. So now you've learned how to identify the cuckoo, and that sound will carry very, very far. Again, a scarcer bird than it used to be in Ireland, still found in all 32 counties, but thin on the ground in some areas now, sadly. <laughs> Okay, I mentioned spring alive there, and one of the species is the, sprit, the swift. Uh, this here is a swift in flight, um, and this bird, um, it has a quite an interesting song. This is the bird I mentioned or referred to at the start of the talk when I talked about birds duetting. Swifts duet, the male and the female have a duet performance that they do together, and it's only in the last few years this has been realized. Swifts songs and calls are kind of the same. They're very high-pitched screaming noise. You often hear high in the sky because they sing only on the wing. In fact, they do pretty much everything on the wing. This is the most aerial bird in the world. They spend more time flying than any other species. And what they do is they make this screaming sound. And it's only recently we've learned what happens is the male screams first and the female instantly responds. So it's almost seamless. It sounds like the same bird making and making the sound. So I'm going to play that for you now. This is the sound of swifts. For me, this is a very evocative. It's the sound of it's the sound of, of summer over Dublin when I was a kid. Male female call response going on there. That's the sound of a swift, very distinctive sound. There's no other Irish bird sounds like that. And that wouldn't be static the way it sounds when you're just hearing it through your speakers or through your earphones. That is wheeling around above you at great speed, moving very, very fast past you. So you get things like the Doppler effect is changing the sound of the pitch. It's really very interesting. So that sound, that's the sound of the swift. Again, if you have swift in, they're, they're the last migrant to arrive really in Ireland. So they're arriving around now. So do log them at springalive.net for us. And BirdWatcher is doing lots of conservation work around swifts. If you go to birdwatcher.ie, you can see our saving swift booklet and see all the other work that my colleague Ricky Wheel in particular is doing to help this species. So a lovely bird. And um, if you want, if you're interested, another example, a famous example of a duetting bird is one we don't have in Ireland, but it's very commonly heard in Britain and across the continent. That's the tawny owl, you know, the famous to wit, to woo, to wit, to woo. What a lot of people don't realize is that to wit is the male and the female responds to woo. And so that's the male and the female doing that together. So that's a, a rare example in Europe of duetting birds. In the tropics, that's much more common that the male and female would do a call response kind of thing. This here is the swallow, a species that's often mistaken for the swift, although they actually look quite different. Uh, first of all, you can see this bird is perched. You'll never see a swift perched. They're not physically capable of doing it. Uh, it's white below. The swift is very, very dark. Uh, this swallow has long tail streamers, a red face, bluish, uh, dark blue on the head and on the back. Also, it's a very different song. It's a very fast twittering sound. They'll often give it when perched on overhead wires. Uh, and it always has this sort of mechanical ratcheting kind of sound in the middle of it. It sounds kind of strange. This is the song of the swallow. Hear that clicking? Like something ratcheting up on a tool. All those clicks. That's the way to identify. Listen for those clicks. So that's the sound of the swallow. That's the sound that they make. So totally different sound to that made by the swift. And then I think this is the last bird I'm going to show you this evening or play for you. This is one of my favorite Irish singers of all. This is a, another type of warbird. This is a black cap. And so named by the male here with the black on top of his head. This bird is one of the most accomplished singers that we have in Ireland, sometimes known as the Irish Nightingale. Um, 
song's quite different from Nightingale. Nightingale's actually, they do have a beautiful melodic song. They've thrown all these weird mechanical notes, whereas the, uh, the Black Cap is actually this really, really lovely flutey. You can, if you listen carefully, you can hear it harmonize with itself using both sides of its, its syrinx uh, vocal apparatus. Uh, and it also has some, some, some sort of scratchy or warbler, warbler notes in the middle of it, but it has a certain, almost a liquid quality to it. There's something very fluid about it. And um, this is a bird that's in fine voice right at the moment. It's quite a common bird across Ireland. Uh, they usually like sort of uh, scrubby edges of woodland and, and sort of overgrown areas. And um, it's, it's a bird that sings throughout the whole day. Here it is. Not really just associated with the drone chorus at all, it sings throughout the day. Wood pigeon in the back. Really melodic, very fast as well. Very fluid song. I always think of it as liquid. It just it just sounds so melodic. It's so rich, and it is harmonizing with itself. So when you hear it in the flesh, just there's something it, it, that elevates it above the quality of lots of other bird songs to the human ears. It's a very pleasing song, to, as far as I'm concerned. And um, so that's uh, that's uh, the the uh, the black cap there. A wonderful little bird. Now, just before we get on to the questions and answers part of this, um, I hope you've enjoyed what we see, you've seen so far. Uh, I just want to say that if you're the kind of person who's willing to give up um, some of your, your precious evening to listen to someone like me prattle on about birdsong, uh, you're exactly the kind of person we need to convince to join Birdwatch Ireland. Uh, we have members who are learning about birds all the time. If you think, for example, that everyone who joins Birdwatch Ireland is a bird expert, absolutely not. The most important yeah. thing is that they want to support birds and help conservation and learn more about them. And the thing is, you never stop learning. The more you know about birds, the more you realize you don't know yet. And that's the thing I really love about them. You never stop learning. So if, if you aren't already a member of Birdwatch Ireland, please join us. It makes a big difference. If you are a member of Birdwatch Ireland, please convince your friends and family to join us. If every member of Birdwatch Ireland was to get uh, convince one other person to join, we would double our membership overnight. And for the conservation charity, that would make a huge difference for us. So uh, there's a few things you get from this. First of all, you get our lovely Wings magazine that comes out quarterly. And that comes, the first issue would come with your welcome pack, which is a lovely set of posters about Ireland's garden birds and seabirds, information about our nature reserves. Uh, you get uh, information in each issue as well about all the branch events that are coming up. As I said, over 450 throughout the year in non-COVID times. Uh, and the magazine as well, full of information about what we're spending your money on, because as a charity, we're totally accountable to our members. We want you to be proud of what you're making possible. Information on wildlife friendly gardening in every issue. We always showcase the work of a different Irish artist or photographer. We have a letters page, we have crossword competitions, uh, information on conservation projects, on threatened species, information by birds from our fellow BirdLife International partners in other countries, surveys you can take part in. It really is great. Uh, if you join as a family or a junior membership member, you also get this, this book here, Bird Detectives, this magazine uh, that comes out twice a year and it's aimed at primary school children, uh, but I know a lot of adults who love it as well. And it's, uh, it's, it's very popular with, uh, with lots of adults and it's about practical help for kids to get to know birds, the Irish wildlife as well, not just birds, mainly birds, but there's also lots about insects and mammals there as well. And it's about them taking practical steps to help the birds, not just learning about them in isolation. So it's great for any children in your lives Bird Detectives as a family or a junior membership of Bird Watch Ireland, that, that makes a big difference. It's a great publication. And then also you'll see there for family members of Bird Watch Ireland, if you join at the family rate, we're giving you a special gift at the moment of a field guide to the common birds of Ireland. Uh, show you all the birds I spoke about tonight, plus plenty more, any birds you're really likely to see in Ireland and uh, that isn't an extreme rarity. Uh, and uh, that's what we give as a special gift at the moment to our family members. So membership runs for 12 months from when you join. So if I can convince you to join tonight, it'll run until this time next year. Uh, and uh, so for individual members, it costs 50 euros. For family members, you'll get the bird detectives on the, on the field guide, it's 60 euros. And there's also a special concessionary rate for senior citizens under 18s and students. So for children, uh, it would be, it's great. And that's only 30 euros. And they get the bird detectives magazine and the wings magazine and the welcome pack and all of that. Uh, and of course, that money that we raise, every cent of that goes to support our conservation work. Uh, and uh, also, it's not just about the money. The more members we have, the more clout we have when it comes to talking to the politicians and the decision makers. You know, the minister has to take our call if we have lots of members because you know, it could affect their vote. 
And uh, that's important. So if you add your voice to ours and we'll all speak up together for the birds, that makes a big, big difference. Um, the best way to join, you can go right now or after the talk to um, our website, which is birdwatchireland.ie. You'll find all the details there. A big button, become a member on the homepage. Uh, and you'll find that there. You can also ring us in the office. The details are on the website, but the, the phone number is 01-2819-878. 01-2819-878. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can join up over the phone. Uh, and uh, so that's a great thing to do. And just to say to those of you who are members, uh, thank you. Uh, on behalf of Andrew and myself and all of our Bird of Journey colleagues, we really appreciate your support. Uh, the past year has been really tough because of COVID. Um, you might have seen we've launched a special fundraising appeal that people can donate to on our website as well, birdreturn.ie. So if people want to throw a few bob in there, we'd really appreciate that as well. Uh, but uh, our members have got us through this really, really rough patch. So many events and, and activities and fundraising events and everything were, were cancelled. Uh, and so the generosity of our members and your membership support has really got us through. So thank you very much. If anyone would like to join, I would really appreciate that. And thank you very much for listening to me. And I'll stop sharing the screen there now. Um, so, um, okay, I think it's time, hopefully, for the questions. So, um, Andrew, I hope you've been keeping an eye on things. I'll hand over to you. Yeah, well done, well done Niall. That was an amazing presentation, beautiful pictures, and it's such a joy to hear all the bird song isolated like that. Um, I was just thinking maybe the key to this whole thing is like the song thrush. It's probably repetition, repetition, repetition. And just the more you hear this, the more it goes in. Um, so we've had some some great questions. Um, one of the first ones I'll, I'll ask is probably Carol was asking, when is the best time to experience the dusk chorus? And it's probably right on time, isn't it? Yeah, it, it kind of it depends on where you are in Ireland because the it, it, you know, the sun sets at different times in Ireland. So there's a difference off of half an hour, forty five minutes between the east and the west. But it is around now. It's just before the you know the just before it starts to get really dark. The birds are singing. So I'm looking outside from my Wicklow garden at the moment and I'm thinking around now the dusk chorus is going to be nice so I would say right after this talk get out and practice you'll practice what you've learned brilliant and on that note is there many different is there differences between the, the dawn chorus in Connemara and Dingle and Dublin uh, there would be certainly and even within Dublin there'd be differences depending on the habitat locally so obviously you're listening to the local birds the ones I've played for you this evening they're some of our most common but there's many many other birds uh, that you could say you could you could hear singing there's many other types of warbler for example which have excellent singing voices uh, and uh, so if you were in an area that had lots of reed beds you probably get sedge warblers singing there you might be lucky enough to hear a grasshopper warbler I was listening to one this morning at the East Coast Nature Reserve in, in Wicklow um, it's a just a rapid trill of notes it's, it's, it's astonishingly fast series of ticks it's an amazing sound. You might hear those. If you're in a bogland, you might hear a snipe. And uh, their contribution is usually in the evening uh, and not in the dawn chorus. And they make a sort of a winnowing sound, like a bleating sound, like a bleating of a goat. But they don't use their voices to do that. They use specially stiffened tail feathers that vibrate when they fly through the air. And that's one you could hear there. Uh, you might be able to hear one of my favorite sounds of all, the song of the curlew. If you're in an area where they're still breeding, there's very few of those now left, um, but really evocative sound, the sound of wild Ireland. If you're lucky in some areas, you might get a corn crake, that sort of ah, 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 that goes on all night long. Uh, that's, uh, that's one that used to be common across Ireland, now it's few and far between. So it really depends on the habitat. So if you get to know what kind of habitat you have, that'll help to you identify the birds. As I said, a bird like a reed bunting, a reed bed bird, is not going to be in the middle of a woodland. A bird in a bog land is not going to be in your garden, unless you have a bog in your garden. Um, so it's about knowing the habitat, really. And on, on that note, Amanda wants to know, is there a difference between urban and rural areas? And in particular with maybe the times of starting. Uh, yes, there can be, especially in big cities where there's lots of ambient light, especially if there's low cloud cover and the street lights are bouncing off that, the birds will start to sing earlier. The clouds can have a big effect on that. Uh, however, in other areas, you know, if there's a lot of cloud cover, it means the first light will break later, so the birds will be delayed. So it, in, in urban areas, the birds will often sing earlier. Sometimes even few species like robins and wrens will sing through the night if there's lots of street lights. What we found from that is that actually shortens their lifespan. They, uh, they, 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 their life is shorter, but they somehow raise more chicks, it seems. They produce more more chicks so it's kind of compensated for uh, but then yes in, in many rural areas it will depend again on what habitat you have around you if you have a big woodland beside you and um, you know if there's lots of conifers in it you'll probably get gold press and and, and, and coal tits but if it's more deciduous you'll probably get uh, black caps and maybe some willow warblers and birds like that you might hear a woodpecker drumming they're expanding now in ireland quite a bit uh, but also i'd say in urban areas they're a lot better than people would expect sometimes an urban or suburban garden will have more bird species in it than a rural garden and that's something to bear in mind. Um, certainly in an urban area, don't think you're excluded from the dawn or the dusk chorus. Not at all. It can be spectacular. 
Brilliant. I'll try and stump you. Um, <laughs> is there a dawn chorus in the summer months above the Arctic Circle? Ah, from... yes. So that is that is a very interesting one indeed. And uh, I uh, I actually was up in Arctic Norway and Arctic Sweden a few years back to hear this for myself. So obviously, if the sun doesn't set for for weeks or months on end, obviously there is no dawn. What actually happens there is the birds tend to be active throughout the whole day. Uh, so it seems they do bouts of singing, then bouts of feeding, then back to bouts of singing. Uh, and because they have 24 hours of daylight, it means that the breeding season is compressed because they can find much more food for their chicks. They get over and done with as fast as they can and then get out of there and head further south before the weather turns. Um, so there isn't such a pronounced dawn chorus. No, they still do have some sort of circadian rhythms that, uh, that, that these circadian rhythms do govern their body clocks. But um, no, there isn't a pronounced dawn chorus. Oh, interesting. And um, what about feeding the garden birds during the summer months? Uh, yes, this is something we get asked quite a bit. And certainly in most cases, if you're using the right kind of food, there's no problem or no harm of feeding the birds in your garden. However, you'll probably find that the birds aren't, aren't using the food anywhere near as much as they would in the, in the autumn or in the winter when it's much colder. It can be a good lifeline for birds, though, if there's a sudden bout of cold weather, as can often happen in the middle of the summer, there can be a chill. Um, you know, even in May, it's not unusual for nighttime temperatures to go below zero. That can be make it hard for them to find food and to kill off a lot of the insects. So putting out some food can help. Just, I would say, if you're putting up food for the birds, no, don't have the feeding stations close to where the birds are actually nesting, uh, because that can really upset them. If there's lots of birds coming in and out all day, there's lots of activity, that can really upset them. So, um, and if you have to choose a time, because feeding the birds can be expensive, of course, uh, I would suggest that uh, you only, uh, you, you feed them mainly in the autumn and in the winter if you have to choose. But if you want to feed them during the summer, go ahead, no problem. Brilliant. Um, is there any new voices in recent years maybe climate change related? Uh, yes, uh, there, there certainly are. So one that I, I mentioned earlier is it's not quite its voice, but it's, it's the great spotted woodpecker, a species that's spreading across Ireland, one that we not quite take for granted here in Wicklow, but that we do hear every day. I was listening to them and I saw a beautiful female feeding on the feeder this morning at uh, the East Coast Nature Reserve. Uh, it, of course, makes its song is drumming on a tree, very fast machine gun like rat -a tat very rapid. Uh, and that's one that we think will be heard more and more now over the over the coming the coming years as the species expands. So that's a new voice into 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 the chorus. Uh, so and, and again, there are birds that are moving all the time. So as climate change hits birds, we're going to lose some species. We're going to gain some species. Uh, we're already hearing like uh, birds like black caps staying for the winter. In fact, probably new species, new 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 ones migrating in and then leaving us, uh, and then new ones coming in for the uh, for, for the summer, replacing them. So that's been a change. Uh, we're also hearing uh, and seeing some chiff chaps not bothering to migrate at all. So they're staying in Ireland all year round, which is kind of strange. And uh, we do keep an ear out. The dawn course changes all the time. And, you know, another one that we hear now is the reed warbler, a species that until recently wasn't in Ireland. Now in the Wicklow reed beds, I hear them quite a bit in the mornings. Uh, Kilcool, East Coast Nature Reserve. Uh, anyone who lives near Arklow, the Arklow Ponds, one of the best places in Ireland to hear reed warblers. That's a new addition as well. Brilliant. Uh, lots of interest in swallows. Um, just oh, three questions. Um, how are the numbers doing? Are they are the numbers decreasing um jillian wants to know her swallows didn't make it this year is it likely another family will move in or has that chain been broken and do they all arrive at the same time or is there waves um that's from brian in dalgany hi brian uh, well, there's lots of good questions there about one of my favorite birds. Swallows really are, are fantastic. And uh, so to answer that question about them coming in, they do come in in waves. Yes. Yeah. So it's not a, a, you know, suddenly click your fingers and they're all there that one day. No, they're spread over uh, over at least a month. So the, some of the early ones will start arriving in, in March. Um, even if sometimes get February records, or those those birds may not make it because it gets very cold. Um, in sort of April, they're really coming in in good numbers. There will some will still be arriving in May. Uh, it's hard to know just yet what the situation is this year because we only have anecdotal evidence to go on. What I can say is that certainly more people than ever before have been contacting us in Birdwatch Ireland to say that their swallows haven't arrived this year and that something may be the matter with them. It's only when we've done the survey work this summer, particularly when Dick Coombs and his team have done the, uh, the, uh, the countryside bird survey, that we'll have a better handle on just what the swallow um, numbers and, and distribution is like this year. But I would say that there is a general downward trend in that species um, because life is tough for them and we're making it tougher all the time. So the thing is that obviously uh, swallows eat small flying insects. That's all they eat. And there are far fewer of those in the environment than there used to be. I remember as a kid, you know, they'd be plastered all over the front of the car, all over the number of the, the license plate and all over the lights. That doesn't really happen anymore. Children don't really experience that to any meaningful degree anymore. And that's swallow food and swift food. So it's no surprise that they're, they're going down in numbers. 
Uh, also, they rely very much on human buildings to nest in. And uh, as, as more new buildings go up, new barns excluding them and all of that, it's harder for them to nest. And old nest structures are demolished. That affects them as well. Um, if they have disappeared, you may get a new pair that would take up residence. Um, if the old pair has disappeared or the old family group has disappeared, um, you, you never know, especially if their nest site was destroyed, they might look for somewhere else. They do have a very long nesting season. They could have three or sometimes even four broods in the summer, uh, which most birds won't. Like a bird like a robin or a blackbird will have two broods, a blue tit only one brood, and swallows will have three. So they will extend that season right through into even sometimes even to October. Sometimes people see the swallows in October and think, oh, they, they should have left. They're very, very late. That's normal enough for September, October, a few swallows still to be around. Uh, another thing to say as well is long term, the, the prospects of the species don't look great because climate change is hitting them in a really hard way because they're trans-Saharan migrants. Our swallows migrate all the way to southern Africa and back. So they have to cross the Sahara Desert twice each year. And Sahara is getting wider by about a kilometer each year, wider and wider. And that's, again, an extra burden, an extra straw on the camel's back that those birds have to get across. Uh, and uh, that's a problem because there's no way to stop. There's no shelter, there's no food, there's no water. They just have to get across it. And fewer and fewer of them are making it. And then, of course, when they are migrating through Central Africa or coming up through Southern Europe, they're getting to more unsettled weather. There's sudden rainstorms and windstorms that are destroying their food source and knocking them off course. There are big problems with that. And then couple that with, uh, unregulated and sometimes illegal hunting in Mediterranean regions, particularly, uh, that's having a big effect on their populations as well. So unfortunately, the swallow's not doing great, I'm sorry to say. Can't say this year how it compared to previous years, but the trend is a downward one in general, I'm afraid. Um, question about robins. Do robins eat, reuse the same nest for subsequent clutches? And also, how big is their territory? Okay. Uh, so the, the question is whether they reuse their nests. The, the answer is sometimes, uh, not always, and it depends. Uh, sometimes the nests have been in a poor state of repair, and very often nests become infested with parasites. So sometimes birds would like to move. Uh, very often, yeah, they might reuse the same nest with, within the same year to raise a second clutch, so they may build another one. That often happens as well. Uh, but from year to year, generally not. If the nest is still in the hedge of the following year, it's probably been destroyed by the elements. They just build a new one. In terms of the size of their territory, it really depends on uh, the vegetation and the amount of food in that territory. So in an area like uh, maybe um, farm fields, where there's some hedgerows at the edges, but then big areas of the grass, it could be quite a large territory. If it's your back garden, there's a bird feeder there and lots of bird-rich native plants attracting, or insect-rich native plants attracting the, attra attracting insects in, uh, what happens is then that they need a smaller territory. It might be your garden and your neighbor's garden, because that's enough to meet their needs. In a woodland, it could kind of be the corner of it, maybe another one further in. And so it really depends on how much, the food, how much food is there. And the birds that have the best songs, so the strongest songs, they'll get the best territory the ones that are smallest with the most food in them because the bird doesn't want to have to defend a massive territory if it can get away with a small one that's generally the rule so it's hard to say really when do they stop singing uh, so uh, when birds will stop singing usually once they have and um, once they've been, they're well in the business of rearing their chicks and the territory has been proclaimed and they've made it and all of that and then they'll stop because there's no real need to defend that territory anymore they might go through the motions but most of the time by sort of mid-june they really are dropping off and by July there are not so many birds singing you will get some young ones maybe practicing their songs you will hear that and uh, wrens particularly keep on going for quite a while song thrushes as well as I said robins never really stop they just keep going but by this time next month it's starting to be a marked decrease you'll notice the difference uh, and then the birds of course are run ragged trying to feed all these hungry mouths they're starting to look quite disheveled and thin and then what they want to do is they start after the birds that the, the, the young have been reared they then keep a low profile because for most of our songbirds then it's time to molt they replace their body feathers they feel quite vulnerable when they're doing that they need a lot of nutrition to enable them to do that too so they need to find lots of food so then it's no point in singing they have other priorities to focus on um i think we'll just take a couple more and um, is there a best time of day to hear the cuckoo and can you tell us a bit about the habitat of cuckoos Absolutely. Well, cuckoos will often start singing quite early in the morning. Sometimes they'll even sing through the night. Uh, and so they'll hear them that. So the cuckoo, actually, no, early morning is often often quite good because it's just something about it, the air, the quality of the air carries a bit further. But they will sing throughout the day. Uh, usually they're perched when they're singing, though I have seen them sometimes sing in flight. Uh, they will do that as well. In terms of the habitat where they are, it's quite varied. It depends on where their host species are likely to be. And the male doesn't care so much about that. That's the female, because the female will lay her eggs in the nest of the same bird, generally, that raised her when she was a chick. And in Ireland, there are a few different species that they mainly parasitize. The meadow pipit is one, 
sedge warbler is another one sometimes dunnocks as well um but so you know they wanted to go to the same bird that reared them so um the females will look for an area that where there are lots of meadow pipits so it could be bogland it could be the edge of a fen uh if they're one if they're ones though that would uh, predate uh, the nests of sedge warblers they're going to want to be in reed beds or in wetlands or vegetation like that the males who do the singing because it's just um you know it's just the male the cuckoo that sings the female makes this weird noise it sounds like someone blowing through a straw making bubbles in water and um, so the male sings, he wants to position himself in a prominent location where oh, he'll intercept any females passing by. Uh, he'll mate with them, then the job done, they'll go on, he'll then call for the next one. And that's what he does all the time. So um, usually in an area where it's quite open and exposed so that he'll be nice and audible and visible, usually on a prominent bush, sometimes on, a, on electricity wires. Uh, in the burren, it's a great place to hear them. Very often in a karst um, limestone landscape, they'll be on one of the, the few isolated bushes singing away and they're very easy to find in the burren. So if you want to find a cuckoo, they're all over the country. Uh, but the burren is probably the easiest spot to find them and actually see them. Great. Um, here's another one for you. Do birds sing together? Is there any examples of a chorus, an actual chorus of birds singing together at the same time? Where they're kind of cooperating or trying to perform together? Yes, no. harmonizing. Yeah, no, in Ireland, not really, no, uh, because um, here uh, we do have a, like the swift, the male and the female singing together in a duet. But apart from that, no, the birds aren't cooperating with each other. They want to, they want to sort of um, squabble and fight with each other and get the best territory. I suppose a bird like the house sparrow, they do um, nest colonially in groups. Now their song is chirp, chirp, chirp. It's nothing particularly notable, um, but I suppose they are kind of performing together, but it just, it just sounds like a noise. That's the sound of their colonies. However, in other parts of the world, particularly in tropical rainforests and jungle areas, you do get some birds that do cooperate in performances. There's a group of birds called the mannequins, which you find in, in, in uh, Central and South America. And they do these spectacular dance performances, also involving sound and you will get sort of troops of males cooperating with each other and the lead male then gets uh, if he's successful then he gets to mate with the females who are impressed the other ones stand by hoping that one day he'll die and they'll inherit his position as the leader of the troop so that does happen in the tropics but not not in ireland or in europe really brilliant okay we'll take one the final question ems wants to know the noises starlings make is that call is that a song or a call the mechanical noises would you call that a song well, they'll, they'll do both. And very often those mechanical noises are their song. And what they're doing is often they're mimicking or imitating the sounds of other birds and other things that they hear. Uh, so um, mimicry, that's, that's in some bird species that do it. That's a sign to show that I've lived. I have great experience. Look how long I've lived, how far I've traveled, what I've, the things I've seen, that kind of thing. And that'll impress a female. So they want to throw as much of that in as they can. So um, there's, a, again, I keep talking about the East Coast Nature Reserve. It's a wonderful spot. Uh, recently, I heard a, a starling there that was very clearly imitating the sound of a curlew. Uh, sort of a bit faster. You definitely, that's definitely a curly that's thrown in there. And sometimes you can hear them doing the sounds of some other birds. Sometimes they'll do the sounds of machinery. Uh, I remember um, hearing a recording once of a starling doing the, uh, the sound of the Nokia ringtone from you know, the old one we used to be on the Nokia phones and uh, doing that. And uh, that, yeah, it is, it's showing off its vocal prowess. That's the way that they do it. They make strange calls as well. They do sound quite mechanical. And that's also the calls, the chatter they have between them. They must be communicating something we don't fully know. But mimicry, not terribly well developed here in, in most Irish birds. There are, some, there are some European species that are very good at it. So probably the prime example would be a bird called the marsh warbler, a bird that looks almost identical to the reed warbler. Marsh warbler are only a very rare vagrant to Ireland, but they are, you get them in some parts of Southern Britain and then quite commonly on the continent. Uh, and it, um, it imitates so, so male, one male, you know, the single male, individual male um, marsh warblers have been found to imitate the songs of over 250 other birds. They have them in their repertoire. And it used to be, if you look back at the old books going back centuries, people used to say, oh, the, the marsh warbler, he, he imitates the songs of some birds, but the other ones, he just makes it up. So half of them, half of them, he's imitating them, half of them, he's making them up. So I can hear the, hear the curlew, I can hear the swallow, I can, I can hear the sound of the song first there. The rest of them, it just seems random. It wasn't random. It was the sound of the birds he's hearing in the winter in Africa. So he's bringing the sound of Africa, the African dawn chorus to Europe, yeah. which I think is just magic. Beautiful, um, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Um, well, thanks. We, we didn't manage to stump you, Niall. <laughs> Top marks on the questions there. Next time we'll get some <laughs> doozies. Um, thanks, Amelia, for that talk. Just brilliant stuff. Lots and lots of food for, for thought. And I hope everyone has a few, you know, a few little tips and tricks that they can, they can start picking up a few species. Uh, and we just want to thank everyone immensely for, for joining us tonight. 
and hopefully you can join us in, in the future. Maybe we'll get Niall. There's lots of requests for Niall. Um, and lots of thanks for Niall in the, in the chat. So Niall. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Andrew, for setting all this up and all the great work you're doing on Birds Connect. Um, uh, thank you to the Community Foundation of Arpa and again, uh, yet again, for, for, for the wonderful support for this. And uh, thank you all for participating and for giving up uh, some of your evening this evening to listen to me prattle on about birds. So don't forget, birdotron.ie. If you're not a member, join. If you are a member, convince someone else to join. We need the help. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks.